Well, Austin, uh, TF Blockchain Chapter, thank you so much for being here. I'm really excited uh, for another great event. It's our first event here in Austin for 2020. Um, wanna, before we start, I wanna give a big shout out to our chapter director, Curtis Friesen, uh, for, for really stepping up here in Austin. Uh, and then also to Zach Ellis, who is our partner with Colliers, uh, for letting us use this amazing space and being a great partner as we continue to grow our community. Um, with that, please help me welcome David Kemmerer of uh, Crypto Trader. Crypto Trader Dog Tax. Sorry, I was going to say Crypto Tax, not Trader. So, Crypto Trader Dog Tax. Give him a round of applause. <laughs> awesome. Cool. Well, hey, David, again, thank you so much for being here. Uh, we've exchanged pleasantries over LinkedIn, um, and uh, it's good to finally meet you in person. Um, so I'd love it if you just kind of give us a, a quick intro about yourself yeah. and, and we'll get started. Yeah, and no worries on the name. I actually despise our name. <laughs> uh, it is hard to remember and I think that's cost us so many customers. But well, you, you know, on that real quick, yep. actually, um, so I'm actually a big fan of having names uh -huh. that are exactly what you do, so sure. that are long and ugly, until you find like the customer and then you switch them. <laughs> and that's what a lot of companies actually do, right? Yeah. Like, they have, well, yeah, like, it's an SEO play, right? It's very right. much to game Google. Yeah. Um, and it's worked very well. <laughs> and now we, we have developed a decent brand around yeah. it. And so it's like, oh, we're going to keep it. Yeah, so now um, you can have like a four or five letter word that makes no <laughs> sense <laughs> that yeah. people will know as you. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I uh, started and run CryptoTrader.tax. And so really what that is, is we automate the cryptocurrency tax reporting process for anyone who's investing, using, or at all in the cryptocurrency world. A great way to frame it up in your mind is just like TurboTax for cryptocurrency. Yeah, awesome, awesome. So before we get to that side, I'd love to kind of get to know you a little bit better. Um, you know, where are you from? Mm -hmm. You know, what's sure. your name? What's your sign? Yeah. <laughs> Just kidding. But uh, yeah, where are you from? Where did you grow yeah. up? How did you kind of get into technology to begin with or sure. finance? Sure. So I am originally from Minneapolis, Minnesota. Okay. Um, so grew up there and then went to school at the University of Wisconsin and was finance and marketing there. So very much on the business side. Um, but always honestly had the uh, entrepreneurial bug, if you will, so I was always the guy doing the side hustles in yeah. college and trying to make money any which way. What, um, what was your best side hustle in college? Um, I started a card game, which was like a knockoff of Cards Against Humanity. I love it. Specifically for colleges. Yeah. Um, and so launched that and that went super viral, but then I got shut down by all the schools coming after me for trademark infringement. <laughs> um, That's the best. The best <laughs> but I, we were selling tens of thousands of dollars of a card game. Um, so it, it, I thought it was my ticket. Um, turned out not to be. Yeah. But um, so yeah, I've always. What was it called? This period? It was called College Cards. Okay. A better name. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it, uh, a much better name. Anyways, um, so I've always kind of been interested in the world of entrepreneurship and just um, business development. And so I moved down here to Austin to get into the sales, growth, and software world. Um, so you know, this is a good spot to be doing that. Um, and for me, for someone who knew long term they wanted to do the entrepreneur thing, I think sales and business development is probably the best skill set you can develop um, to be a good entrepreneur. Um, I think it's very underrated, but sure. being a really good salesperson. Oh, it's it's so key. Yeah, so, just, and because you're you're not just selling a physical product or mm -hmm. a virtual product or a software product. You're also selling yourself, yep. your business, yeah. your co-founders, the technology. And just learning how to reach out to people is so valuable. And so many people who haven't worked in a sales job don't realize that like business development deals don't just happen. Like sure. you have to make them happen. Yeah. Um, I think that's an edge we have against some of the people we compete with today. Totally. One, of my, uh, one of my first jobs was actually, uh, or my first job out of school was in the mortgage industry mm -hmm. and it was just cold calling. Cur yeah. Curtis and I did it together. Yeah. <laughs> so it was cold calling, and um, if you did not make three hundred cold calls, like you were getting written up. And so, talk. oh, it was crazy. You had a day. Yeah, a day. Oh. Yeah, and not only that, it's like you also had to close deals, right? And so, like, we would, we'd have these things called power hours, where it's literally like you're just. 
dialing and just dialing and dialing and dialing. With, go. with like rock music blasting in the back. <laughs> yeah. anyway. auto dials. Yeah, it was crazy. Anyway, yeah, sorry, but, go ahead. And it, probably not the best experience in the moment, but looking back, I bet you're like, wow, that shaped oh, exactly. my ability to have a phone call with anyone and immediately establish rapport and trust and just be really good at that. Sure, and, and like so underrated. No, totally. What we would say, and, and Chris and I talk about this all the time, is that you know, if you can convert someone over a phone call and you're just basing, you know, your sales ability or and, and saying the right things to them based off their voice inflection, right. when you're in front of someone, when you're in front of another human and you can see like their facial mm -hmm. expressions and how they're responding, mm -hmm. it's just like it's even easier, right? right? So it's it's definitely I, I don't disagree having yeah. sales experience or understanding that's super totally. underrated. So yeah, so that's why I came to Austin, started doing that and was still side hustling on other projects. Um, and that's ultimately what brought me to crypto. This is back in mid 2017, right before things really took off for the first time. Um, I had learned about from a dinner I was with with a friend, he had a buddy who was making about $70,000 a month market making on Binance. Wow. And so this is still early days when liquidity was not what it is now. Um, and the spreads on these assets were just massive and not as many people were doing it. There wasn't much software to automate it. Um, and so obviously I was blown away by that. And I called my brother who's fairly, fairly technical, much more so than I am. Um, and we started trying to do it. It didn't go nearly as well as we thought. Um, but in doing this, we had hundreds and thousands of trades that we were making with this high volume market making strategy um, every single month. And so that's what made me uh, come across the tax problem, yeah. right? And so with the last company, especially College Cards, right, had run into legal, legal trouble. So I was very keenly aware of, hey, we need to do things right this time so we don't have to shut down the whole business. Um, and so I very much started looking into how do we get compliance so that you know we can actually make money and not have the IRS coming after us you know three years later and so started doing what anyone would when they have this type of problem and start googling around trying to find some type of solution that can automate this mass trading strategy that we're doing to file our taxes for us and there was really very <coughs> limited stuff out there um, basically nothing this is two and a half years ago and so you know that's how we became aware of the problem and um, I pulled together a team, a couple um, very close friends of mine, and we started CryptoTrader.tax now from, to solve Friends that. from Minnesota and Arthur? No, yeah. just through life and yeah, through yeah. just, you know, stuff like this, honestly. But um, yeah, so me and my, I have two partners and they're both full stack developers. Nice. Um, and so we started it to build tax offer to automate that exact problem. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. awesome. That's mm -hmm. awesome. So, um, cool. So, t so, yeah, so take us through that. So, yep. Uh, you find this need and you just start building. Um, yeah. Did you kind of put together an MVP? Were you building stuff for yourself really quick first? To yeah. Test it or? First, it was really just an interesting project. Yeah. Right. It was, we had this problem. A zillion people on Reddit seemed to have this problem because everyone was um, complaining about this and, you know, the IRS is never going to get me and just, but people were freaking out. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, we put together a pretty crappy MVP. I look back at our old demos and it's like, wow, that's really bad. But we threw it out there on Reddit and immediately got like a few hundred users. Nice. Um, the product didn't work back then, but there was very much interest. And so that was, you know, three months in and we're like, all right, we should double down and actually build out technology that can scale because it looks like we can at least build some type of business. Again, did not think it would become what it was. Um, and so then, doubled down, started actually investing in building infrastructure that would scale well, right? Writing good code. Um, simultaneously, I'm doing a lot of SEO and content marketing to just continually be getting users signing up for the wait list, which we had at that time, because Red Software is not live, we took it down to rebuild it. Um, and then things got really, really crazy when TurboTax reached out to us that fall. And what we, is this, 2018? This is so. fall of 2018, right? So September of 2018, TurboTax, the strategic partners team reached out um, and like, hey, you know, we've seen what you guys are doing. At first we thought it was a joke. We thought someone was just playing a prank on us. It was an Intuit email and it, it literally said like, we'd be interested in talking about partnering up. And Lucas, who's my co-founder, you know, he first saw it and he texted like, haha, very funny. Uh, but we got on a call with them and you know, they were very serious about it. Um, and so we partnered up with them before last year's tax season. And then 
you know, we, we launched the product with the goal of doing like $30,000 for the whole year in revenue and it just blew up. Um, and so then it was like, okay, let's go. And so last year we all quit our jobs and started rolling with it. Nice. And you mm -hmm. said you were telling me that you bootstrapped the whole thing, you and your yep. team. Yeah. Yeah. So initially because no one would have given us money, <laughs> like we're all fairly young. Um, and so that's why we did. But now, right, we have investors who are lined up and who would want to put money in and we're not taking it um, just because it's still at a position where you could argue, hey, does this make sense to take venture money? It always complicates things. Um, and if you can't see your, you know, building a 50, $100 million revenue in your business, maybe it doesn't make sense to bring in venture yet. But it could change, but yeah, we're completely bootstrapped to date, very um, intentionally at this point. Yeah, it's super impressive. I mean, bootstrapping a company in any industry is mm -hmm. difficult, right? Yeah. And then, mm -hmm. you know, especially something like this. And yep. That's great that you're able to see, uh, you know, positive revenues from yep. that partnership mm -hmm. to, to make it happen. Mm -hmm. So um, tell us a little bit real quick about this, the project, or sorry, the product, right? Yep. You know, how does it work? Totally. Like why, why does someone use this product? Yeah, yep, so really anyone, who is investing, um, buying, selling, trading, cryptocurrencies, um, is triggering taxable events. And so the way the IRS treats this is property, similar to stocks, similar to real estate, right? When you dispose of the asset, you're technically incurring some form of income, whether it's, you know, you're losing money or you're gaining money from the transaction, you have to file that. And so how CryptoTrader.tax work is we build integrations with all the leading cryptocurrency exchanges and platforms out there um, so that our users can just sign up, you know, OAuth into those accounts or just connect the other cryptocurrency exchanges, suck in all their transaction history into CryptoTrader.tax. And then and only then, once everything's in, they can generate their capital gains, capital losses tax reports with the click of a button. So you just like use their, whatever API the exchange has? Yep, yep, plug into all the APIs and integrate directly with the transaction history files that they export. Um, so actually, it's a fairly straightforward business as to how the technology works now. Dealing with cryptocurrency data and cryptocurrency exchanges APIs is very difficult. Yeah. Um, and so you know, that's a whole another process. But I'm yeah, the product is simple. It's just plug in all your stuff import it into our app, generate your tax reports. And I'm assuming some of the exchanges probably do things slightly different. Oh, right? very differently. Like, so like, to... yeah, for example, like just a simple thing, not every exchange call or the ticker symbol on each exchange is not the same for all assets. So like Bitcoin cash on one place will be BCC and another place it'll be BCH. So our software has to be smart enough to recognize that, hey, that's still the same asset, even though it's called this over here. And that happens all the time with, you know, you can imagine there's thousands of cryptocurrencies at this point. Yeah. Um, so like now, right, I look back to our old MVP and it was so bad, but now we've built a very sophisticated piece of software that like does a lot. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, super interesting. Yeah. And um, so, and then I think you said you can pull down reports and you can use it. Yep. And so if I'm a consumer, um, I, I'm a, I just download your app or I use your app mm -hmm. and then I probably just, you said I OAuth into each one of the exchanges that I currently have and so forth. Yeah. So pull that report, do I give it to my accountant or how, do, how yep. does that kind of work? Yeah, great question. So once you've generated your report, we like to say there's kind of three approaches. One, you can easily import it into software like TurboTax and that's from the partnership that we built with them or Tax Act or really whatever tax filing software solution you use. This is very popular for the do-it-yourselfers market, right? Most people don't use a tax professional. Yeah. Um, so that's our most used option. Two, you can directly send it to your tax professional, these reports, um, and that comes with all the instructions of how they can file it for you if they're not familiar with it. Yeah. Or you can just file it yourself. So those are three options, right? Import it into you know, your preferred tax filing software, give it to your tax professional, or just file it yourself. Perfect, nice. Yeah. Um, so let's shift to just kind of taxes in general mm -hmm. when it comes to cryptocurrency. You know, help us understand how um, how that's evolved, right? So uh, how has the government kind yeah. of been uh, more or less involved in cryptocurrency from a tax perspective? Mm -hmm. You know, now in, uh, for this most recent filing, there's actual a line um, on the on the form that right. says like hey like you know have you traded in crypto mm -hmm. but what yeah. was it like you know five years ago ten years ago and mm -hmm. how has that evolved over time yeah so I mean from what what it seems the government's really started taking interest back in 2017 right when just 
mania happened and Bitcoin ran up to 20,000. Um, but they, they released their first guidance in 2014. So actually like a decently long time ago. Um, and that, that explained how they're treating cryptocurrencies as property, not as currency, right? contrary to the name. And really what that means is that the capital gains and losses rules that apply to other forms of property also apply to cryptocurrency. So a good example, right? If I invest $100 into Apple stock, that investment appreciates, let's say over X amount of months, and then I sell it for $150, I have a $50 capital gain that gets filed with my tax return, and depending on my personal income tax bracket, I'll pay a percentage of tax on that capital gain. And it works the exact same with cryptocurrencies, right? If I buy Bitcoin for 100 bucks, sell it a couple months later for 200 bucks, well, that $100 gain gets reported on my tax return because it's a form of income, and right? Here in right. the US, we're taxed on income, no matter how you make it, whether you're running an ice cream shop or whether you made it trading cryptocurrencies. Um, but yeah, so then you, you, you mentioned it here in 2019, things have gotten much, much crazier and the IRS is driving a lot of customers to us um, just because they're driving so much more awareness of how it works, right? So over the past five years, most people who are in the crypto world, were not paying taxes on it. And that's still the case today, to be honest. Um, we'll see if it changes this year. Um, but now the IRS has kind of put their flag in and kind of three things happened this fall. So first they started sending out warning and action letters um, to the folks that they subpoenaed. They subpoenaed Coinbase and got accounts of all Coinbase users and essentially sent out blanket letters to all those folks saying, hey, we've seen that, you know, we suspect that you haven't been filing your taxes accurately, or maybe it was just a letter that said, here's how cryptocurrency taxes work. So when those letters started coming out, you know, you can imagine all the media outlets, the coin desks and the coin telegraphs, you know, covered this like crazy. So, you know, we see a huge spike anytime an event like that happens, right? The IRS is trying to essentially scare people into compliance. Number two, in October of this year, they came out with their second form of guidance, which was the first time they've released anything since 2014. Um, and clarifying some things, they put out a new like 40 plus question FAQ piece of content, kind of explaining again stuff we're talking about here, how cryptocurrency is taxed, how you know mining income is treated, and you can check that out. It's in you know pretty straightforward English. And then the final thing they did, which is pretty absolutely crazy if you actually think about it, is they changed 1040 Schedule 1, which is a tax form that is filled out by every single American taxpayer, which is approximately about 150 million people. And now under penalty of perjury, over 150 million Americans are going to have to answer if at any point during 2019, they bought, sold, transferred, or obtained any financial interest in any virtual currency. And so, this is just a effort by them to increase compliance, increase awareness, and essentially make people take a stand on their tax return, whether you know they're transacting with crypto. Um, so we're gonna see compliance very much spike this year. Um, but that's kind of how the, the tax landscape and how the IRS has been treating it and what's been going on um, from the regulatory side. Right, right. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because there's this narrative that cryptocurrency or Bitcoin, you know, is very private and decentralized and, and this and that, but it also matters like how you acquire Correct. Bitcoin, right? So like if you acquired it through an exchange and you went through KYC, yep. um, regardless, you know, there, there's a clear path as mm -hmm. to how you uh, obtain that Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And then if it gets subpoenaed, like you're talking about exactly. Coinbase now, sure enough, like this, you know, yeah, they have they have the data now. Right. It's not right. So, so you're exactly right. So you're not people aren't wrong in saying that cryptocurrency is this quasi private thing sure, sure. at the blockchain level. But no one it most people are not interacting with the blockchains themselves. They're going to exchanges to buy. And what do you have to do when you sign up for almost all exchanges now? You have to KYC in. And right. so, you know, they have your driver's license, they have your social security, um, and all all of them are under tremendous amount of pressure to you know, go through these KYC procedures if they want to operate in the United States, which is um, frankly one of the biggest markets for this space. Um, and so, yeah, you're exactly right. Is the exchanges are the the culprits behind ratting you out to the IRS? Yeah, which is it's kind of funny when you think about it right. because like the exchanges are by far the most profitable oh, aspect yeah. of mm -hmm. the of the industry. Mm -hmm. So it's 
they're not going to kill their goose, right? Like you, you're not exactly. Doing, like you have to be compliant. Exactly. If you're not, you're killing your whole business. Exactly. Like, and some have decided to, you know, blacklist the U.S. market. Um, but you know, the really profitable folks, the Coinbase's and the Gemini's of the world, you know, they're doing all they can to to get um, regulated so that they can operate. Because yeah, they're making millions and millions of dollars every single day. Right. right? Just off this sheer trading volume. Um, so yeah. Um, the other thing that's interesting, right? Crypto was born out of this like anti-state, anti-establishment movement. Um, but I was talking to um, Alex Mashinsky, who runs Celsius, uh -huh. and he, you know, makes a very good point. Like that was just how it got started, and it's kind of like this, you know, the the baton is being passed, right? The the anti-establishment pe people got it to, you know, what the first million people, and then the libertarians took it and said, like, "Oh, this is so cool. We want to use it so that." you know, we can dethrone governments. And now to get it even to the next 100 million users, more mainstream people sure. who Enterprise want, commerce. who believe that, you know, we need roads, schools, um, police forces, right, which are funded by taxes. Um, and so the way we see it is, number one, this is going to be an infrastructural piece of this market, right, compliance, regulation, taxes, um, and so, to get it to that next really threshold of 100 million users, um, you just have to make the reporting really easy. And so that's what we're trying to do. Right, right. Yes, yeah, it's, it's the evolution of innovation. Yeah, exactly. Right? You, you know, you think about a lot of technology started off on the fringe or, you know, even with the quote unquote bad actors exactly. or so forth. Mm -hmm. um, but then. And it gives it a bad rep, but no, it was just that's the, the, the evolution of it, like you said. Yeah, yeah. Totally. Um, Curious, and we don't have to go here if not, but I'm curious what you know about tax implications when it comes to like say ICOs or like how companies have fundraised and so forth. Um, and uh, when it comes to that, mm -hmm. you know, like so if a company raised X amount of dollars with an ICO or if a, um, uh, a, a company is issuing tokens, like do you know much on that side from the- So we don't deal with that, right? So that gets much more into security laws, right? right? right. And so we don't actually have to touch that. You know, that's the, the companies that are, you know, financing through that way, you know, they probably need to be working with securities lawyers. And again, this is all still very gray area as to how all that is going to work. But really all we have to care about is, hey, someone invested in it and then they sold it for more or less than they acquired it for. And so that's they're going to owe taxes yeah. or not, or it's gonna reduce their, you know, taxable income. Yeah. So we're lucky in that we don't have to deal yeah. with the, the gray area. Yeah, that. that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, how about with commerce, right? You know, yep. we hear about um, cryptocurrency as being a, a very viable option for payments mm -hmm. or transactions. Um, you know, people debate whether Bitcoin is a store of value versus mm -hmm. versus a payment method. And you're right, if you spend this crypto, um, you get capital gains on yes. it, right? So yeah. does your software handle like payment yep. aspects of it? Yep, all of that, exactly. And it, it's a huge pain point in the industry. So first of all, yeah, CryptoTrader.tax handles that. Well, you know, you just, wherever you're spending it or however you're spending it, you're going to get some type of transaction history, whether it's on Cash App or whatever it is. And we integrate with all these these platforms. So yeah, we handle that, it's a taxable event. But just the whole other point of it is that's frustrating and we are just as much frustrated by that um, as everyone else. And I think what's going to be in interesting and I think where actually the government looks like they're taking it is they're going to not blanketly classify everything as property, right? right? And so, for example, something like stable coins, right? When you use People aren't investing in stable coins to get rich, right? That is truly the use case for, um, uh, uh, what do you call it? Transfer of, not, not transfer of value, but um, medium, of medium of exchange, right? That is truly trying to be a medium of exchange so we can go peer to peer um, and you know, you're helping people who maybe aren't, aren't banked properly, right. um, et cetera. And so right now, because that's so blanketly treated as property, when I you know, go, Bitcoin and USD or whatever, or USDC, anytime I'm transacting with a stable coin, that has to be reported on 8949, which is your capital gains and losses form, just like if you had sold your Bitcoin. So, but, but it's stupid because you're, you're not reporting any gains or losses. Right, right, that's what I'm saying. That's right. what's so silly about it. And so where it looks like, and some piece of legislation has come up in Congress where it looks like they're gonna have three, three different categories. They're going to 
have crypto commodities, crypto securities, and crypto like currency. And that's the stable coins would be actual currency, commodities would be you know similarly treated to how commodities and then securities would be much more like stocks, equities. Something like Bitcoin is always going to have capital gains, right? Yeah. People are investing in it to make money, right? They're trying to make income. But for USDC or Tether or DAI, um, these things people aren't trying to make income off of, they're just trying to use it for various use cases. And so I think we'll see, it, it'll take time, but tax legislation um, evolve around that. And we need that to happen totally. um, for Wait. the industry to keep growing. I 100% agree. I mean, I definitely see a world where you see like stable coins is just the norm, right? right. Well, essentially, what we're talking about is um, wrapping currency digitally. Right. Like, really, what you think right. about it, right? it's like, hey, and, and like that's the whole reason why J.P. Morgan Chase did their stable coin. It's right. just, it's not, you know, it's to tra transfer money faster. Exactly. Right. And so, I'm giving allowing that for commerce or allowing that for mm -hmm. consumers to do so. What was the bucket you said that would be in, the stable coin again? Uh, I can't remember, I believe it's like cryptocurrency. Got it. So that's, like that's the actual, actual, that's an actual currency. currency. Right. The other ones are like crypto securities, crypto commodities. And so I think there's efforts um, within you know the government to classify these assets into one of these three buckets. Yeah. And so the tax implications obviously differ for something that's classified as a commodity versus something that's a security versus something that's actually being treated as a medium of exchange. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's exciting and um, you know that would be good for the whole industry because then oh, right. someone who's seriously just using USDC to spend money or to send it to someone in a different country, right? Then that's not triggering a taxable event. Right. And you don't have to report that and yeah, exactly. You're using it for commerce or exactly. for, for purchasing goods or, mm -hmm. or services and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so you know, I, I find the uh, the payment side of things is, is for me of the most interesting use case mm -hmm. when it comes to you know cryptocurrency. Mm -hmm. you, we talk about um, China and the digitization of the yuan, yeah. the yuan, and then um, you know people are talking about um, how U.S. dollar could be digitized, but it's again it's for payment aspect, right? right? Like mm -hmm. it's a transferring of, of currency. Um, very cool. So um, we'll open it up here to questions with everybody here in a, uh, here in a second. But um, before we do that, um, what are what are some things that you're seeing? Uh, you know, forward looking when it comes. You touched on sure. some of the things, but what are some things that you're seeing forward looking when it comes to how taxes are going to be um, reported mm -hmm. or even just from like the, the software element of things, yeah. what are things that you're seeing? Yeah, I can hit on like our development roadmap a bit and kind of where we see the industry going. So right now we're seeing um, a tremendous um, amount of folks who are getting into the lending space, who are you know receiving interest space from loans, whether that's from BlockFi, whether that's from you know all these different Celsius. DeFi, yeah, Celsius, all these different DeFi platforms. Um, so that's huge and that's only going to grow and it's it's very much largely fueled by all these people who want to be doing margin trading on these exchanges um, because the exchanges themselves right they need to be delivering those assets for the short sellers and so they need to be borrowing crypto from someone and so this lending environment is growing um, and that's why you see folks like BlockFi and Celsius you know getting very big and we'll see exchanges start to offer lending products right because um, they already are custodying all these yeah, assets so they can lend it out um, so that's huge and that's a really big um, focus for our development team on top of that further supporting the margin traders derivatives futures options right we're seeing things that exist in current financial markets just get replicated within the crypto markets um, and for good reason. And so that's another thing that we're um, very aggressively and quickly building out because our customers are demanding it of us. Not everyone's just trading on spot markets. Um, and so we're seeing that. All, and all this is very much fueled by the feedback we get from you know the thousands, thousands of people that we work with. Um, on top of that, just like legislation wise, um, yeah, I think the biggest thing is what I hit on, you know, it will be great if they can come out with different buckets, not treating everything blanketly as property. Um, i trying to think, I'm sure other things will come to mind yeah. as we talk about it, but that's off the top of the head. Yeah, no, it's, 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 it's natural that you take the existing financial system mm -hmm. and then you say like, okay, how would this work exactly. in an environment, mm -hmm. uh, in a crypto environment? Yeah. Right? 
I mean, you're kind of seeing that across various industries, yep. but finance seems to be. Yeah, and then the other the thing playing off that is, and I kind of hit on it, but the tax implications and tax, right, it's not gonna go away. And so it is an infrastructure piece. And so here at CryptoTrader.tax, we do wanna be the go-to place for everyone in crypto to get their taxes done. Yeah. And so that's why, you know, rolling out lending um, support, rolling out derivatives, margin trading is very important because we wanna be able to service everyone. Right. Um, and you know, that's very much fueled by the demand in the market. Yeah. So, so there's this constant narrative about like how the U.S. is more strict or, or maybe um, uh, doesn't provide as much guidance as say like other countries or you know you could also maybe look at it as like other countries are um, just like not providing any guidance at all and that's why right. So um, depending on, on where you sit on that, um, you know, my question for you though is around um, what are the opportunities for you know your tax software or how other countries might be looking at this? Are there other countries that are um, similar to, in thinking to this? And then even the countries that maybe are very lenient, I'm assuming people still need to yeah. be able to um, you know monitor their trades and so forth. Yeah, so that's a great question. We hadn't hit on it at all, but so what we do, right? It's a very pointed piece of the entire tax return, right? We're not doing the whole return for people, right? You take our reports, you plug them into TurboTax, they handle your holistic return. And so what we do, primarily capital gains, capital loss reporting, is actually applied very universally, right? It's, it's in most countries, they handle it similarly. So for a company like ours, international expansion is a very big focus. So this summer we rolled out Australia, um, and we'll, we'll be going to Canada in about a month. We'll launch our Canada product. Then we'll go to the UK after that. Um, and this speaks to the software that we've built in that how we can make it scalable because, like I said, capital gains, capital losses are, are treated fairly um, universally. And so we just have to tweak slight logic for each country um, to roll out that support. And so for a company like ours, we, we can have an international um, audience and so that's a big lever for growth that we're going after um, in terms of how other folks are less or more strict lenient than the US I think it's true I think a lot of people naturally wait um, to see what the US does yeah. Um, but yeah for example like Portugal I, I think there's no taxes on gains France only taxes you on when you actually cash back out to fiat um, there's some other folks that are different than the US but outside of that, most people are following the U.S. steps. Australia is the exact same. Canada is the exact same. U.K. is slightly different. There's a big market there too, um, with London being there. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of how we look at it internationally. Yeah, mm -hmm. very cool. But it's interesting. Definitely, mm -hmm. definitely. Um, I think those are all the questions I have. Cool. I'd love to open it up for, for everybody. So do me a favor so we can make sure that we um, get this, uh, your audio. I'm gonna spin my mic around. Just kind of ask your question loud if you can. Okay. And we'll get, get you picked up. Yeah, so my, my question is in equities and things like that, you have lot selection. Um, if you bought some Apple early on and then you bought some Apple three years later, when you go to sell it, you get to choose which lot. When you sell on Gemini or Coinbase or whatever, um, it's picking the lots for you, essentially. I mean, it's on the blockchain and there's a record of it, but for tax purposes, do you have to use the lots they chose or can you pick LIFO, FIFO, whatever works out best? Yeah, that's a great question. And so this was such a big gray area before this past guidance came out in October that we talked about. So the IRS um, essentially came out and said, you can specifically identify um, which cryptocurrencies you're selling as long as you can identify it's like four things and you'd have to go back into it but it's like date and time you acquired it cost basis that you'd acquired it at XYZ so there's four things software platforms like ours automatically will give you those four things so and again I'm not a tax attorney so this, none of this is tax advice but it's very um, there's a strong argument that you can use specific identifications, which mean you can use minimizing algorithms like last in, first out, yeah. like highest in, first out, right? These are all costing methodologies, right? Similar to first in, first out, which is typically used in the equities markets um, to minimize your gains. And so there's a big opportunity 
for people to go back and amend their previous year's returns if they've been using FIFO. And again, I would very much recommend talking to your tax accountant for anyone who's listening, um, whether if they think this is something you can do. Um, but you can see your taxes drop by you know thousands, thousand dollars if you're using a minimizing costing method. Um, but yeah, really good question. It looks like you can use specific identification. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Can you speak to, you, you spoke a lot about selling on exchanges yep. and that you're integrating with exchanges for people that are selling to other individuals or who are participating in Ethereum gaming or mm -hmm. using decentralized exchanges. There are no exchanges to integrate with and a, a lot of these things are happening in wallets. Are you supporting on, like, can someone just enter specific wallets into your application and, and be able to calculate their taxes that way? Yeah, that's a really good question too. Um, you know, the whole Ethereum community um, and consensus, right, is doing such cool things. Unfortunately, it's very difficult to write really uh, slick tax software to help with them. It's it's totally on the roadmap and like, we're rolling out support for things like Uniswap, you know, MakerDAO, Compound, all these Ethereum ecosystem apps. Um, they're not out yet, so you wouldn't be able to, you know, simply enter your wallet address and us be able to sort through, you know, go go into the Ethereum blockchain and you know hash out, okay, this, 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 and this and this. But that's where the industry is going. And, you know, we operate in a very competitive space and everyone's going after the same stuff. So you'll see it in the years to come, but no one has that stuff out yet because it just takes more investment, more development power, time. Um, yeah. but it will come. And uh, so I have just a follow-up yep. question. Uh, Non-fungible tokens, are do you, do you view those in the same way? I mean, the IRS has never really given any right. guidance on NFTs. They are traded on some exchanges like OpenSea. Mm -hmm. um, they seem like like-kind exchanges. Like, if, you know, you, you have one game character and you swap it for another game character. Mm -hmm. um, they're literally characters in a game. They're also not really investments. Like, right. people are playing video games. Do they need to be playing, paying taxes on gaming? And how how should they think about that? Yeah, I mean, the default still is I would talk to someone who's familiar with crypto, but because the IRS is blanketly still treating everything as property, non-fungible tokens included, if you have a gain or loss in it, right, that needs to be filed, or when you dispose of it, I would still be reporting it on 8949. Um, I forget the other part of the question. Um, but, but it's a gray area, right? Like you said, uh, oh, the like on exchange piece, I think that's a tougher argu argument to make now that after Tax Cuts and Jobs Act came out, they essentially eliminated like on exchange for anything but real property, which is like real estate. Um, mm. And so everyone's most tax professionals now post 2018, you know, like on exchange isn't even a relevant argument know. for um, tax buyers, but pre 20, or 2017 and before, a lot of folks are taking the stand that, hey, all my crypto trading activity classifies under like on exchange, um, and so I don't have to be paying capital gains, or it doesn't trigger until I cash back out to fiat. Um, again, that's a tough, tough position to take. Um, some people are taking it, like we'll see, it'll get, it'll get settled in the courts for sure, um, but we'll see. We take the most conservative approach always. Go ahead. Yeah, so uh, I have a question just as far as emerging markets uh, with what you're interested in right now from where you're at. Uh, coming into 2020, are there any emerging markets that you see that nobody has really kind of gripped or looked at right now that you've got your eyes set on that you'd like to get more connected to as far as just uh, capital gains and losses? So emerging markets, like countries-wise, or more within the cryptocurrency within space? Yes, yeah, yes. yeah. So I, I, I think the DeFi services they're gaining so much traction. Like, you look at how much Ethereum has been locked up into collateralized debt to positions with the MakerDAO ecosystem. Last year, I think it was two hundred some million, and this year it's up to I want to say around seven hundred million. And so that's a three x increase in just a year. And so, you know, you look at the, the growth curve of that, it's, it's exponential. So next year, it's likely going to be way more than 700 million. And so within the Ethereum ecosystem, this DeFi and just decentralized finance, right, as it is, is gaining so much traction. And so 
I was harping on my team. We got to roll out products to, to service these people because there's so many people getting in. And then even the centralized folks that are doing the lending, like the BlockFi, like Unchained Capital here down the street, um, you know, all these services are catching so much more adoption um, because if you can make 8% on your crypto just by depositing your Bitcoin with Unchained Capital or with BlockFi, right? What bank is giving you 8%? So that's a huge use case in itself. And again, the interest that you make from those accounts is taxable income, Schedule B. And so, you know, again, if, if we can create a platform that just brainlessly, no one has to understand how this stuff works, but just plug in their stuff, we spit out what they need, um, you know, we can build a valuable business to, to, to go into uh, the long term. Totally. Mm -hmm. hey. Yep. Yeah. Um, so you talked a bit about like the IRS subpoenas and everything like that. Um, you know, someone who's been obviously up on all that news, you probably read it all. Um, what did you see between the battles of the exchanges and the IRS between how much information they were sharing? Because I think the mm -hmm. case law of how much they're allowed to share and how much the exchanges push back really defines the IRS's power to mm -hmm. subpoena again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to be fair, I don't know that much. This, I think the subpoena happened a long time ago. I want to say it was 2014 or 2015 when they actually subpoenaed them, and they ultimately won X number of years ago. But I, I've spoken to some folks who run exchanges, and I know they get like dozens of letters a month from folks, you know, different government agencies saying, hey, we want to see X, Y, Z. And so I think they ignore most of it. Um, but for the stuff that is important, they have, you know, slews of lawyers who deal sure. with this. Um, but yeah, it shows just the cost of doing business in the U.S. is insane from complying with this stuff. Uh, I feel bad for the exchanges. Like, <laughs> but I mean, it, it creates this moat, right? If, if yeah. the Coinbase's and the Gemini's of the world can afford to spend millions and millions of dollars with securities lawyers and compliance people, you know, it becomes so much harder for the next entrepreneur to create the next Coinbase or the next Gemini. So they welcome this intense regulation, right? Um, but but yeah, I, I don't know how much they take seriously. Um, obviously they, they take it seriously, but, um, and I don't know the process of like how intense it is, um, but it's interesting. Anybody else have a question? Do you think there will ever be anything like a de minimis exemption like there is with foreign exchange yeah. currencies? Yeah, I love that idea too, um, especially if something like the, the stable coins blanketly being treated still does, doesn't come to fruition or essentially these buckets like we talked about. Um, a de minimis, and I think Japan actually implemented something like this. I could be wrong. But yeah, so really the idea is, hey, your first $500 of gains um, are not taxable and so this would encourage you know me being able to buy a cup of coffee with Bitcoin because that small gain um, isn't going to be taxed now I still don't know how exactly that would play out because you still have to be keeping track then yeah. of once you hit the de minimis point it's an interesting idea I don't think anything will be passed that includes that because it still really has the same problems as in you need to be tracking everything that you're doing um, but We'll see. Yeah. Anybody else? Um, I have a quick question. Yeah. So, when we're talking about capital gains, you know, can your software actually be used to tr to track um, traditional investment vehicles, right? Mm -hmm. So, like even stocks, or could someone use it for for that? Or no, we're solely crypto. Yeah. Yep. No. And so, actually, that's a whole. So you, you, it's why can't, the question is why can't my cryptocurrency exchanges provide me with a 1099B? Because the typical world of capital gains, right? It's you go through a broker, let's call it E-Trade, Charles Schwab, Robinhood, and at the end of the year, they give you a 1099B, which is really the tax report that lists out your capital gains and losses for the year. So the fundamental problem that exists in the space and the reason why we exist is because cryptocurrency exchanges do not have the ability to provide that form. And that's because of the transferable nature of crypto, right? Because I'm, I can just send Bitcoin into Coinbase. They have no idea what the cost basis of that Bitcoin was. They don't know how much I bought it for. So they can't possibly say, hey, David, you made $3,000 with us this year because they, they don't have cost basis. Where Robinhood, E-Trade, 
at Charles Schwab, they don't allow me to just simply send my Apple stock to go capture some arbitrage opportunity from some exchange in China, right? Everything happens on solely on their platform, the buying, selling, trading. And so they are able to give 10 to 99 B. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. Right, and so that's the fundamental problem. And so we've written a lot about that. Um, but what worries me, and I've been on calls with the IRS, is they might just require exchanges to issue 1099 B. And I've tried to explain them that this will go terribly because they don't have the ability to do this. Um, and so if they blankly say you have to provide 1099 B and it has to be completely filled out with cost-based information, well, that essentially bans Coinbase from like accepting crypto in digital wallet from an outside address or sending it. What will likely happen though, if they do make them do 1090B is they will just send the form with missing cost basis rows. And so I've already seen that happen. It might be Kraken or some other exchange gives 1099B. And it's funny, it's, it'll, it'll show like the asset traded, um, the, the, the proceeds, right? What it was worth at a time. And then the whole cost basis column is completely empty. So the form is useless, but they're still giving it to their customers. Um, so yeah, these are all, this is all the problems that we solve, right? You hear like 1099Ks that the exchange gives out and that's really just a summary of all of your transactions, um, which really has nothing to do with capital gains and losses. I'm going off on a tangent now, no, no. but there's interesting it's, things. Right? Totally, totally. Mm -hmm. So when, when you take your money off of an exchange yeah. and you, you know, you essentially put it to your cold wallet. Um, how does the exchange interpret that? Right, Do exactly. They interpret that because sale? from and actually, this is a hard, uh, hard challenge to solve for our software developers because from the exchange, it just it shows right that you transferred that cryptocurrency outside of the Coinbase network, right? And it's no longer in your Coinbase wallet. But that could have been used to pay for something. It could have been sent to someone as a gift could have been sent to your cold wallet. And each one of those three things I just listed has different tax implications. And so software like ours right now cannot automatically know that you spent it on something. All we can see is that it was transferred out. And so all the platforms right now, and we, we take a unique approach to streamline this, um, and I won't get into it, but to answer your question, yeah, the, the exchange essentially just says, hey, they'll either treat it as it's not technically a tax event, but they'll include it on 1099K to, as proceeds. So it seems like you just gained this astronomical amount, even though you just sent it to a cold wallet storage, yeah. which is not a taxable event. Um, and yeah, these are all reasons why just plugging your stuff into tax software makes it easier because we're only taking the taxable events, right. not transfers, and our software sifts through all of that. Yeah. Um, you brought up something that made me think about yeah. this. Um, you said gift, right? Mm -hmm. so are gifts treated the same way? Because uh, you can gift a certain amount of, right. of, of uh, income or whatever to like a family member or so forth. Yes. Is it treated the same way in crypto? Yeah. Um, I would want to bring our tax person just to fully answer that. But I know they are tax exempt up to like XYZ. So yeah, a yeah. good way if you have huge gains and you don't want to realize the gains, if you gift you know, X amount of your cryptocurrency to stay under that threshold where it's not taxable just because it's a gift, you can pass that on. The problem is the cost basis still gets transferred to the person you're gifting it. So when they sell it, they'll incur the huge gain. Yeah. Um, but yeah, for you, it wouldn't be taxable. Right. right. So that, that's actually why you're seeing um, these charity organizations around crypto explode because it's this way to not realize a taxable event and still donate to your charity of choice. Um, and so we saw that like a couple months ago, I forget what the company was, but you know, they got Coinbase and Gemini and all these companies involved in this huge charity thing. And it's really just people trying to dodge tax reporting. Yeah, yeah the yeah. crypto version of it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, awesome, man. Well, hey, this has been a super great conversation. Um, before we end, um, we love to have our speaker kind of leave a question to our audience, something that they can think about. Mm -hmm. Is there a question you want to leave them with? to kind of think through uh, while they're listening or before mm. you know everybody here takes mm. off. Let me think. A question to think about. Um, I would just, I'll, I'll take it away from taxes because I don't know, I'm just, I'm gonna, well, where do you think the, the use case is within cryptocurrency that's going to bring in the next 100 million users? Question for everyone. I'd be curious to know. What Does anybody have a thought real quick on that? I think cannabis and hemp 
<laughs> gambling. Gambling. Yeah. I think I think probably gaming or commerce. I think commerce on my side. Yeah. Or potentially NFTs. NFTs are super interesting. Yeah. The currency per se, but it's assets. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I know the original crypto people, the first group we talked about, are gonna fucking hate it. Oh. But it will be a company that's like like a Starbucks or something. Yeah, it's just Amazoning crypto basically, yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> Awesome, cool. Well, uh, everybody, please uh, join me in thanking uh, David for coming out here. Give him a round of applause.